Hi, everybody. Because um, persuasion is so important to your career paths, uh, we're going to spend two days talking about various aspects of persuasion. And today's discussion is about rhetoric and logic. After we talk about rhetoric, we'll talk about logical fallacy specifically. Uh, when most people think of the word rhetoric, they think of the adjective rhetorical, which is like a rhetorical question, meaning a question that doesn't have to be answered. That's actually kind of a misnomer. Rhetoric is about persuasion. Um, rhetoric is, is essentially the understanding of how things persuade. And so a rhetorical question, that name actually comes from the fact that a question that you don't intend to be answered is a question designed to persuade someone. That's So when you ask a rhetorical question, the goal is to actually persuade somebody with that question. You're not really asking for an answer from them. You're actually trying to change the way they consider something by asking the question to begin with. Um, I'm going to make the argument that all writing employs rhetoric. Um, there's sort of this false dichotomy between informative writing and persuasive writing, something that you've actually learned uh, in your writing classes up until this point. It's not true. All writing is persuasive. All writing employs rhetoric, and I'm going to I'm going to prove it with an argument. Okay. So first of all, my first premise is that every statement made asks us to believe it. All statements assume that they are true and invite the hearer, listener, reader to to agree to its truth. And so long as that's the case, every statement involves some sort of persuasion. In fact, that simple statement there asks you to believe it. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, it's a, pers it's, it's a statement that then persuades. Because every statement asks us to believe its truth, therefore, every statement is persuasive it, or persuades us. Um, all writing consists of statements. That's what writing is, is chains of statements. And therefore, all writing is persuasive. Um, so-called informative writing is all of it is all of that is persuasive too. Um, any sort of report is persuading people to believe it, whether it's trying to get a certain decision or not. Um, it is persuasive in the sense that it's trying to uh, reflect truth and get people to believe it is true. So it's persuasive. And I'd also add that good persuasive writing is informative. Um, not all persuasive writing is informative, but good, good persuasive writing is. So this dichotomy between informative writing and persuasive writing is, is kind of a false one. So I need to add one more element to make my argument sound, which is that all persuasion is rhetoric. That's definitionally true. Rhetoric is the study of persuasion. And so if all writing is persuasive, all writing employs rhetoric, so you can't get away from it. And there's a sort of a negative connotation that, that, that rhetorical writing or persuasive writing is somehow manipulative, um, that, read, that people who are good at rhetoric are untrustworthy. And that's not the case. Rhetoric is simply the way we try to persuade, and we're constantly trying to persuade in pretty much everything we do. And so, in fact, it, it's not so much a question of... of um, of whether or not we're persuading, it's more a question of how. I used rhetoric here, specifically logos, to persuade you that all writing employs rhetoric. So again, if the question the question is not if writing persuades, but how. And that's why I wanted you to make sure you understood these four um, elements of rhetoric in the reading. Uh, I thought the reading was great. It's a really simple introduction to basic rhetoric, pr rhetorical principles. Um, you know, if you're having a hard time remembering what these four terms mean, you can just remember these, that logos is logic, so you, you, you're appealing to logic. Pathos is an appeal to emotion. Ethos is an appeal to the person, meaning you're particularly persuasive as, as, a, as a person, char charismatic or whatever. And then mythos is an appeal to community. So I want you to understand these because these are useful tools. And the book, the Baker book, does a good job of pointing this out, that there are times in which you need to use logical arguments, times where you need to use emotional arguments, times where you need to draw attention to yourself to be persuasive, and times where you need to draw attention to the community to be, to be persuasive. But all of these are important to understand and use in your careers. Okay, so that's it on rhetoric. The reading is really more of what I want you to know from that. But I, I do want to spend some time going through logical fallacy. And I'm just going to go through a bunch of logical fallacies. And, and these are really common. I picked ones that I think there, there are hundreds of logical fallacies, fallacies, depending on how you define them. I just want to talk about the ones I've included here. Um, I will also tell you this ahead of time as you're going through these.
you will lose points in class on the things you submit if in your persuasion you rely on logical fallacy. Um, you don't need logical fallacy to be persuasive. And so I'm teaching you these because if, uh, if my TAs or me find any, or I find any of these in your writing, then uh, we reserve the right to dock points for it. I'm not doing this to scare you, but just to make a point that you really need to think through the arguments you make so they can be rationally sound. Okay, so let's jump in. I hope I've scared you enough to pay close attention. All right. The first logical fallacy is the straw man argument. This is where you present and defeat an argument your opponent has not actually made. Um, I'm trying to use really controversial examples with each of these, so here's the statement you might hear. Conservatives want all of us carrying guns, which is obviously unsafe. The reality is conservatives don't want all of us carrying guns, at least not all conservatives. And so you're presenting an argument this, that's, that's not ever actually put forth, this idea that we should all be carrying guns. Um, and and it also creates kind of an accusatory nature, right? It makes it seem like you're, oh, they're so stupid because they believe this, when they don't actually believe it, so you shouldn't be accusing them. And by the way, if uh, if you think I'm going after liberals by pointing out this logical fallacy, conservatives are going to get their fair share of criticism too. All right. In fact, right here. So ad hominem is where you attack a person rather than the argument. Um, Richard Dawkins is a famous... Uh, atheist, and uh, he gets a lot of uh, a lot of people don't trust him because he's atheist. In fact, atheists are are actually less common, and people trust pretty much any other religious belief than more th in, in a politician than they will trust an atheist. And, and so this effect is true. Um, Anyway, so here you'd say, why should I? Why should I trust a person who doesn't believe in God? Um, right? You're attacking the person's character or their beliefs rather than the argument being made by the person. Um, there are various versions of an ad hominem, ad hominem attack. One is the no true Scotsman idea, where you say, oh, you know, no true American will believe this. Um, there's also the genetic attack, where you say, oh, anybody who comes from that family, right, or or uh, from that part of the country doesn't know what they're talking about. There's poisoning the well, which is sort of preemptive ad hominem attack, where you say, now my opponent might try to get away with a really terrible argument that, whatever. Um, you know, they're, they're essentially trying to cast the argument as terrible before the argument's even being made. Uh, essentially, these are all attacking. Um, and beside, they're not contemplating the argument, but attacking the person making the argument. Okay. Um, appeal to common belief is another popular um, logical fallacy. This is sort of citing general agreement as evidence of truth, like, oh, everybody believes that, therefore it must be true. So many Mormons are Republicans, it's obviously the party most aligned with our beliefs. Uh, you might hear that at church on Sunday. Um, it's not a defense of uh, belief. It simply says a lot of people believe it. Well, that doesn't necessarily make it true, right? And so uh, you have to be careful with that defense. Appeal to authority is another common logical fallacy. This is where you cite credentials as evidence of truth. Well over 90% of the world's scientists believe in man-made climate change. That's a great example you hear all the time. Um, that doesn't prove climate change. Um, it it's, doesn't logically prove the existence of climate change. Um, now, it may be the case that this is evidence that points to the idea that that the proof of climate change is persuasive, but the proof should be evaluated on its own merits, not on this idea that that authority figures are in agreement with it. Um, appeal to nature is another kind of appeal to authority. Um, sometimes we say that because things are naturally that way, that's the way they should be. Um, you know, that's really popular in food, for example, that natural food is best, um, and therefore genetic crops are bad. Genetically altered or modified crops are bad. Um, you know, smallpox is natural, but uh, we got rid of it because it wasn't very good. So that's it, another version of appeal to authority. Um, begging the question, uh, the, the people misunderstand this. I, In fact, I still misuse this phrase sometimes. Begging the question does not mean my statement invokes the following question. That's not what it means. Begging the question means that you assume the conclusion in one of the premises of your statement. So, you know, t to ask a person, how long have you hated poor people? That's begging the question because it, it assumes, the statement already assumes the person hates poor people. And so it's not really, um, it, it's just assuming the conclusion. 
So that's begging the question. False dilemma is a logical fallacy that provides only two or a few opposing options when many options might be available. For example, you might hear it said that you can't be a Democrat and be pro-life. Um, you could invert that and say you can't be a Republican and be um, against the Second Amendment, um, you know, against um, broad gun ownership. I, the reality is, is that there's a great diversity of political opinion within the two, par the two dominant parties. And so, um, you know, these false dichotomies are a way to, to – these false dilemmas are a way for us to preserve our argument because usually it means it's either my choice or this horrible outcome. And uh, that's why people use false dilemma as a logical fallacy. Another version of this is a purity test, right, where basically you say you're not a real Republican unless you believe whatever. In fact, in politics, there's a term for that. They call it a rhino, R-I-N-O, which stands for Republican in name only. Um, that's an example of a purity test where you're only Republican if, and then you demand some belief. If you don't share that belief, then you're not a Republican. Um, the, the same is true on the Democrat side. And, and uh, we use this in all kinds of settings where we want to sort of define with purity um, what, what the party or the group believes. Okay, another logical fallacy is that of weak analogy. This is where you compare something to a dissimilar circumstance. Some people might argue that denying a person health care <clears throat> is tantamount to denying them food or water, right? Because if you deny them health care, they might die. And if you deny them food or water, they might die. So therefore, the analogy is apt. Well, it's not because health care is very expensive, whereas food or water are abundant and, and inexpensive. And so you can't say that they're equivalent because demanding that we offer expensive, uh, scarce resources to everybody simply isn't feasible, whereas, whereas providing everybody with food or water is far more reasonable. So that's an example of weak analogy. Weak analogy is is also used with what one one source I read called the argument reductio ad Hitlerum, the idea that you just call somebody you compare somebody to Hitler and therefore their their argument is wrong. Um, you know the campaign uh, uh, to prove that President Obama is a secret socialist is a good example of this. I mean, I don't know, maybe he is. I don't know for sure. But the point is, a lot of the arguments making the case are terrible, because they go back and say, "Well, Hitler did A, B, and C, and Obama has done A, B, and C. Therefore, Obama is equivalent to Hitler." Whereas there's so many differences. The 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 the, the analogy is really weak. Um, related to that is one of my favorite internet laws. So there's this great law called Godwin's Law. And it says that as an internet discussion continues, the likelihood of being compared to a Nazi approaches one. And so the probability that you'll be compared to a Nazi as an internet conversation continues is very high. And it's because people resort to really weak arguments when their arguments start, start to fall apart. And one of the ways you can do that is just to compare somebody to Hitler. So anyway... That's Godwin's law. Um, a, uh, a, another logical fallacy is the argument from ignorance. This is where you claim a lack of contrary evidence as proof of your argument. Um, you know, in response to that Richard Dawkins idea, you know, uh, a lot of people say, well, you can't prove God, the, the atheist Richard Dawkins. You can't prove that God doesn't exist, so my belief he does exist is rational. Well, technically, that's not true. Um, just because something can't be disproven, that doesn't make that thing true. And so, um, you know, that's the difference between proof and faith, I guess, in a religious sense. But, uh, but here, you know, people often claim that because there's no opposing proof, therefore it's true. Uh, for example, somebody might say that, um, you know, the Patriot Act has been working because we've had, you know, no terrorist attacks in our country since that point. Well, you know, you could also say that because I bought um, polar bear insurance, I've never had a polar bear attack me. You know, that's that's there's the lack of contrary evidence is not proof. OK, um, there's uh, another fallacy called false cause. This is where you assign a causative relationship to merely correlating events. Um, I've heard this said before that liberals are more likely to have a college degree, so therefore we should all be liberals. Um, college degrees are desirable. Liberals, it's true, statistically are more likely to have a college degree, but, but there's not a causative relationship. 
between those things and this idea that we should all be liberals. It's, it's a leap. Um, you know, another interesting example of this is that in Washington, D.C., um, as the sale as ice cream sales go up, so does the murder rate. It's kind of a curious correlation if you don't stop to think about it. But when you do, you might realize, oh, wait, okay. So ice cream sales probably go up during the summertime. And during the summertime, people are more likely to be outside. And as people are more likely to be outside, they're more likely, although not much, but a little bit more likely to kill each other. And so there's a correlation between the increase of ice cream sales and murders because of the warm weather, which is probably the actual more interesting link. Um, another example of false causes when you get a sample bias, right, where you sort of pick a sample that you think supports your, your opinion. And uh, so... Uh, you might, you know, for example, say, well, you know, everybody in my neighborhood uh, believes the way I do, um, and therefore I'm right. Um, that's another example uh, of that uh, false cause connection. Okay, a slippery slope um, is where you claim that one choice will lead to a chain of unprovable dramatic outcomes. Um, you know, you heard this a lot during uh, and during the. Oh, debates over the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and this idea that any government intrusion into health care will lead straight to socialized medicine. That's a classic slippery slope argument. There are actually a lot of intervening events that would have to occur before we got to the point of socialized medicine, and that first step is not sufficient to, to carry out all those other steps. So that's a good example of a slippery slope. Um, finally, it's... Uh, uh, I've got two more. Let's talk about the red herring. Red herring is where you redirect the argument to a different issue to avoid criticism. So somebody might say that, you know, your your position is unconstitutional, to which you reply, well, why do we care so much about something written hundreds of years ago? Um, that's changing the argument. It's throwing out a red herring. Um, it's throwing them off the scent, so to speak. Um, you draw this person into a debate over whether or not the Constitution is valuable when the original criticism was simply that your position was uh, disagreed with the Constitution as it exists today. And then finally, the one that bothers me the most is tu quoque, which is uh, Latin for you too or you also. Um, and uh, this is where you just respond to criticism with criticism. So, you know, somebody calls you stubborn, you say, well, yeah, well, you're as stubborn as I am. Well, it doesn't excuse stubborn behavior. It's simply now you have two stubborn people instead of one. Um, two wrongs don't make a right. I guess. And so this is another logical fallacy you'll see all the time. Um, what I'd like you to do is uh, we'll spend some class time tomorrow talking about logical fallacies. So as you're reading the news or anything like that, I encourage you to find a logical fallacy in the news or any other source and bring it to class tomorrow and share your examples. So thanks for listening. <laughs>